I'm JJ Heller, and this is Instrumental, a show about the big and small moments that shape our lives. Big love happens in the small moments. Hey, everybody, it's JJ. And her husband, Dave. Welcome to another normal Forward moving, non it's backward. Not normal. This is not but normal. But it is. It's it's like normal in the sense that most people would do a. We are weird. Forward. No, uh, we are normal, and everyone else is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think most would disagree. I think every podcast should be told backwards. Okay. Except for the the one that we're doing right now. That's confusing. Mm-hmm. Okay. If. This is your first time listening to Instrumental? That might have been confusing to we you. We <laughs> normally tell stories backwards. <laughs> uh, season three, we're telling them forwards sometimes. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Log that away. Today, our guest is none other than Lee Nash. And if you are not familiar, she was the lead singer for the band Sixpence, None the Richer. Kiss me beneath the bearded barley. Nightly. Beside the green, green grass. Yeah, maybe we should let her sing it instead. Okay, maybe I'm not supposed to sing it, but you have a great version of it on I Dream of You, Volume 3. We couldn't resist. It's such a great song. We needed to make a lullaby version of it. And it is real good. It is real good. But Lee did a great job singing the original. (laughs) Nothing like that one. Kiss Me was actually written by Matt Slocum, who is like the other founding member of Sixpence None the Richer. And for most of the songs on their records, he was the primary songwriter. And that actually has a lot to do with Lee's story because Matt did so much songwriting that after the band broke up in 2004, Lee was left to kind of navigate, okay, where does she belong? in the musical landscape. Is she a songwriter? Is she a performer? And it took a while for her to find her footing. Lee has released several albums as a solo artist. She is a songwriter in her own right, and she has created some really beautiful material. And you'll get to hear a couple of little clips of some of her songs later in the episode. They're so great. But before we get into all of that... Our interview with Lee begins with one of the most notable moments of the band's career, a performance of the song Kiss Me on The Late Show with David Letterman. Oh, man. Did you used to, like, stay up and watch The Late Show? Sometimes. My bedtime was, like, 10 most of the time. I know, me too. And so it was sort of a special event if you could, like, stay up and watch a performance or something. Yeah. Well, and this performance was back in 1999. So I would have been a freshman in college. I didn't even have a TV. I didn't have a TV either. We missed it. I know, but it's on YouTube. That's true. Well, one of the exceptional things about the band's visit on The Late Show was that Dave actually invited Lee to sit in the chair and like be interviewed after the performance. Which doesn't happen very often with the, with the musical guests. Right, yeah. So we'll let Lee take it from here. It was cold in the studio, as is legendary. I don't. I guess I don't know if they were trying to keep the heat bill low, <laughs> or if Letterman just liked it cold for the I don't know bacteria reasons. <laughs> or something. I'm not really sure, but it was freezing, and I wore something I bought. I remember I got these incredibly high heeled uh, shoes in Japan. I saw them, and I was like. I'm going to wear those on Letterman. And um, so I bought those, and then I, I got this gray outfit to match. But there wasn't a lot of coverage. I, my arms were super exposed, and so it was freezing. Um, and that, on top of being petrified, was not maybe the best combo. But my husband, at the time, he and I were right there when we were about to walk out, and we said a quick prayer and I did some deep breathing and I walked out and David immediately, immediately caught, we made eye contact and he said, I want to talk to you after you guys play your first song. Wow. <laughs> I, was like, I wish you could have told me that after the first yeah. song because I had to <laughs> sing the song knowing I was going to go sit on that chair. And like I said, I've been a fan for so many years and seen him 
eviscerate people and also be really kind and really smart and thoughtful. And uh, we caught him on a good night. And I think he was charmed by the song and by the band and interested in the name enough to ask the meaning. But I couldn't have dreamt in a million years we were going to get that opportunity to talk about the name. And I wish I, I, people are always so kind and say, no, you did it perfect. It was perfect. But I wish I could have been a little bit more eloquent, but I was. Oh petrified. yeah. You were super nervous. <laughs> and, um, but it was just a, an amazing opportunity to get to, to say that. Um, and, and he was so gracious to give me that opportunity. What do you wish that you had said differently than what you said? I just wish I had told it without giggling so much. <laughs> I kept turning around and looking at the band, like, can you believe this is happening? And I just um, had to get kind of, there were stops and starts. And because we've been asked so many times, and I was always the one to answer it, because even though Matt is the one that named the band right. and was the huge fan and is the huge fan of C.S. Lewis, he didn't want to give that answer so he didn't right. so it was always my my job yeah. and I have some secret rage about that but um <laughs> the name um for for anyone who doesn't know there's a book that C.S. Lewis wrote called Mere Christianity and there's a a story he uses in the book to illustrate basically that God gave us the gifts that we have and when we use those gifts he's no richer for the transaction because he gave us the gifts in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the story is about a, a boy asking his father for a sixpence to buy the father a gift. And the father happily gives the son the money and loves the gift, I'm sure, but he was no richer. And so it really is, it's just a, it's about humility and just trying to keep a level head and, and realize where you got your gifts and not be pompous about it. Yeah. And he helped me and David helped me finish the thought and restating what it meant. And that was that was almost the sweetest part for me. Oh, it, I mean, we've seen the segment and it's just really charming. The fact that there are so many stops and starts is actually... I think I think it's what's so wonderful about it. Yeah, it's like really it. endearing. Yeah, I mean, because people relate to your humanity. I think they'd rather be drawn to somebody than impressed by somebody. And I think that's exactly what you did. That's a good point. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I remember being on the bus and, you know, the bus times that we had had previously where it was just fun, playing Monopoly, food fights. I would uh, get the guys to get into fights with each other. And they knew, I would say, hey, you know, Jerry Dale, Sean called your mom, a whatever. <laughs> and they knew I was joking, but they would totally just start just fighting. It was the funnest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> anyway, every band's got their weird stuff and that we did some weird stuff. But when I was pregnant with Henry, I would just basically walk around the bus with a pillow over my belly and just get in my bunk and lay there because I just I didn't want to fall. I didn't want anybody to fall into me because, you know, buses can, you know, can be kind of rocky. And so I started just that mom thing kicked in and I started protecting him. Hmm. And so, you know, the more pregnant I became, the more I realized I'm not going to want to put up with any of this drama. I want this child to come and us to be ready for him and and it all be about him. <laughs> and so when Matt and I, we had a conversation on the phone where we just kind of talked about what we wanted to do and we decided to break up and and then it was on CNN. It was like went across the ticker on CNN a few days later, like band Sixpence on the Richer breaks up. And I, I remember thinking, dang, did it have to be, did it have to be like that? Like, I wish we had just said, why, like, why not just say, let's take a break? Right. <laughs> um, but so many, so many people end up doing that. And yeah, I, it wasn't necessary because we did go on to make, another record we made more music and we probably still will make more music but yeah I just I think the the pregnancy in me wanting to protect Henry caused me to just be like no this is it I'm gonna go a different way do you remember where you were <laughs> I was in the bathroom <laughs> 
I mean, I can't believe you asked me that question. I really didn't want to answer it, but I was peeing. <laughs> and I just, I'm not kidding. I was in my mom's uh, house and she was, she's a teacher and she was at work and I was staying down there with her. And I was about seven or eight months pregnant. And so you pee all the time. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so it's like, not that unusual. What are the odds? And so, <laughs> yeah. And it was just one of those things like, well, I'm sitting here. And so I just sat there and finished out the conversation with him. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and I want to say he called me to talk about the future of things. And he set out some different options. He was like, we could start a band at whenever we feel like it, not now, but start a band with a completely different name and truly have a fresh start. And if I had it to do over, I would have been like, that's the thing. Let's let me have this baby. Give me like six months and then, you know, see how we're feeling and let's let's do that. And we could have, but Matt started an awesome band and did music and is still doing music. And uh, we've had conversations in the last six months about making a new record. And I really hope it happens. Um, but COVID kind of got in the way of everything yeah. for everyone last year and this year. When you had that conversation, was it kind of a matter of fact sort of thing or were either of you emotional about it? No, I think on one level I might have been, but I've only been pregnant once. I was sort of a different person hmm. during that pregnancy, just like really drawing my lines, making clear boundaries. Like, this is what I can't do. This is what I won't do. I won't have this tension around my new baby because it affects the kid. And I knew that. And we did have tension between us and I wanted it to end. And I love Matt Slocum like a brother. And I love him more now than I ever have. But at the time... I needed any and all tension that I could get rid of to go away. And I, I don't know if that's normal. I, I think I've heard other moms say that. Yeah. Um, and I had a, you know, a particular situation <laughs> with the tension and the band and this, you know, the stress of the the touring. And, and yeah, I didn't want that to be a part of when Henry came into the world. I wanted to welcome him with all my energy and attention. Yeah. So you guys have this conversation. You decide this band that we've devoted over a decade of our lives to needs to be over. And you hang up <laughs> in your mom's bathroom. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> what is the feeling that you feel like as soon as the, the that call is over? I felt like I just cut the strings to like a lead balloon, which really doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, just <laughs> a boulder. cut something that was the, a boulder. Yeah, yeah, just cut it off. And then later, I definitely became sad. But that's a different that's a different time. But at the at that moment, I was like, this is the right thing because I don't have to dread awkward, painful phone calls anymore. Like this is, it's just about my family and about this baby. <laughs> it's kind of been that way ever since. <laughs> <laughs> How quickly after Henry was born did your marriage implode? Yeah. <laughs> um, it started before he was born. Yeah, I just felt like my partner was lost. And Henry was two and a half when things went went awry. Okay. And, um, and we kept it together uh, as best we could. And I can say now, like all, all along, we've co-parented. That child has never felt like... I don't think I could have him come in here. <laughs> so I, I think he has always known that he's number one and that we love him more than anything. And Mark is is truly, he's my first call after my mom when something happens and I'm upset and I'm his first call. So that relationship is not dissolved and like that we're not friends. So that makes us even better co-parents because we're not just co-parenting for the sake of it. We really love each other. And I love his wife and 
you know, we spend all the holidays together. Wow. And I know, I don't mean to sound like divorce is awesome. Everybody <laughs> should do it. But we took something that was really complicated and painful. And, and I want to say, you know, the story it's, it's not over. Like we've worked through things over the last 14 years, little by little and really caring for each other and knowing we care for that kid more than anything in the world. Yeah, man, I I love Mark. (laughs) And he's still, I mean, we can, it's such a blessing. My husband likes him. Nothing makes me happier. It was Henry's birthday the other day and sitting around the table with Mark and his wife and Stephen and me and Henry and Stephen and and Mark making each other laugh. It's just, I'm like, this is home. This is family. Hmm. It's not been perfect, but we've worked really hard and it has not been easy. I'm sure. Yeah, I had a very, very sad moment that I will never forget. And it was right when, you know, we were still living in the house that, you know, Henry was born and we hadn't sold the house yet. And uh, it's, oh, it was so painful. I remember when I realized that he was gone and he was, because they were, we went back and forth a little bit. I remember I wrote a letter where I just, I begged, like, please forgive me. Please come back. We can make this work. And and he, you know, we both waffled a little bit, but this was the night when I knew it was over. And I walked to the top of the stairs and you turn the corner where our bedroom is. And I, I stopped and I sat down <laughs> at the top of the stairs and I bawled my eyes out and begged God, like, please turn back time. And when I turn that corner, please... I'm going to choke up a little bit. Sorry. Let him be in there. And it doesn't work that way. That was awful. And I think that illustrates how much I loved him and still do. Mm. Um, but just that it it couldn't go on like it had been. It just couldn't. Yeah. But I, I don't think God has ever heard me pray so fervently, like, please, let's just, if you, if you can do miracles, you can do anything, go back and I'll turn around and he'll be sitting there reading a book. And I'll get in the bed and we'll talk. We'll watch our we'll watch David Letterman. It'll be normal again. And it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's it's so beautiful then to think about, I mean, that prayer that night for him to just be there in the room. Mm-hmm. And then to think about what you just told us about the other day, how Mark was in the room with you celebrating your son's yeah. birthday. Yeah. And it just feels so redemptive. Yeah. You know, you're 100% right. It is redemptive. And in a million different moments since then, I have an angel boy. I don't know if it'll always be that way, but he, he was and always has been a delight, just a light. I mean, just a giggly little fun box. And he slept like a champ. And and I had help. Mark, also, when we split up, we decided we'd have dinners together every night. And he'd be there for breakfast in the morning. Wow. And so most of the time, that was the case. It wasn't just me and Henry. You know, Mark would come around. He'd help with homework. He and I both also found other partners within a year that we're still with. And so there was never a revolving door of like, oh, mommy has a date tonight. I didn't want it to be yeah. like right. that. So it wasn't really just like me and Henry against the world or setting out on our own. We I had a lot of support from his dad because he's awesome. Yeah. I grew up Southern Baptist. And so the divorce was most difficult on my mother. <laughs> hmm. Even though I was incredibly upset. My mom, bless her, really had a hard time with it. And so we struggled and our relationship is amazing now. I'm happy to say it didn't, it didn't last long, but yeah, she's still, she still harbors a lot of feeling about it because 
of what happened to her in her marriage. I think it's hard. You see mm. your children repeat something and it's like, don't do that. Don't do that. You have everything. Don't mess it up. And so there was mm. a lot of that. And therefore I carried around a tremendous amount of guilt. So yes, I had faith, but you know, the, the flogging that, what is, is that a Catholic thing? When someone, you know, you whip yourself. They beat themselves. Yeah. I had some boots that the nail, I love the boots, but the nails in the bottom were coming up. They were so old. And I wore those even though they made my feet bleed like every day. I wore them. It hurt, but I felt there's a connection there. I felt like I deserved it. And I know that's mm. really a very visceral, like, the imagery there is probably not, not great, but it's true. I wore the boots probably from the divorce time for about three years and wow. just let my feet bleed. And with every step, it was like, this is what you did. This is what you did. This is what you did. That's not what God asks mm. us to do, but it's what I did to myself. And, you know, I didn't go to college, so I didn't have any like party years, didn't have a lot of, fr I didn't have a lot of friends. I had one girlfriend, the friend that was in the band with us for a while, Tess, who was a, a great friend. And I had a great time. But after the divorce, it's funny like a lot of people come around because they're like, oh, she's not perfect and she's in town mm. and maybe she's cool. It's, you know, so I had a lot of people come around me after that. So I had some new friends. I have this awesome baby. I had babysitters. So I'd put him to bed at night and go out and have like a blast. And I kind of wish I could go back and tone that down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what do you, I sewed some, what do you call that? Oats? Wild oats. Well, wow. yeah, I had some. Yeah, I did. And and I that's fine. I mean, no harm, no foul. Thank thank God, you know, under God's protection, I, I was fine. Um, and it didn't involve like dudes, like dating or anything, but just drinking and going out and, you know, just having those wild party years at 29 and 30. On the one hand, you were having this party season, like mm -hmm. as you're coping with this grief, but you're simultaneously wearing boots that are making your feet bleed. Was there some moment like when you finally threw away those boots or what was the sort of moment where you said, I don't need to do this to myself anymore? No, I, I think if I, if I had those boots back, I'd probably put them back on. <laughs> I, I <laughs> carry that. I don't want to blame it on, you know, Baptist. I know, I know my God. I know that's not, that's not what he wants for me. It, you know, that would be my issue. The boots probably started smelling or something. I, that's probably why I threw them away. <laughs> but, um, but I definitely, what I think one of my lessons in my lifetime is that God has wanted me to understand that he was all I needed, is all I need, and is my father, you know, my heavenly father. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an amazing mom that reminds me constantly, I'll call, because I call her every day, like, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. And she says, keep your eyes on what's eternal. Nothing else matters. So I've got hmm. like a mom like that. She's amazing. She's always in her Bible and she always seems to have the perfect thing to say to get my mind out of the mire where God doesn't want it to be. I think I got enough living under my belt to get the courage to make the record I always wanted to make, which was this country record called The State I'm In. And that was a turning point for me as a songwriter and as a woman, as an artist, and just stepped into a new confidence. And have you heard of the band Not A Surf? Mm -mm. It's fine if you haven't, but... The singer for that band, Matthew Cause, I just happened to have a conversation with him. I didn't know him before, but our very first conversation 
about 15 minutes long. I, I don't know why, but I told him, I was like, I really want to make this record. I always have since I knew I wanted to sing and I wanted to be like a Texas tip of the hat to all the music that inspired me and made me want to be a singer. And I went on and on about it <laughs> to this brand new person. And he said, you know, you can do that. And he said it several times. And I swear that was what made me go, okay, well, if Matthew Cause says I can do this, because I love his band, I was like, I can do it. So I went home and started making plans. And we made a record. And that is the solo record that I am very proud of. Hmm. And I think that was kind of the season and the moment and the pictures, like where the songs said what I wanted to say. It was super snarky and the kind of country music that I love. And I stepped into my confidence as an artist and a woman. Is there a song from that record that kind of epitomizes all of that? Well, the, the record's called The State I'm In, which was a double entendre the, the state I'm in and the state I'm in, meaning Texas, because it's all very, uh, there's a song called Somebody's Yesterday that's, you know, Texas is bigger than I remember. You know, the sky like never ends and it's about lost love. And it's just all the sad, ballady places I always wanted to go. There's also a song called Tell Me Now, Tennessee, which is about me um, being homesick for Texas and for my mom and driving over the bridge back to, to head back to Nashville, you know, where it says welcome to Tennessee and Memphis um, and how I just wanted to just do a U-turn right Turn up to the bridge and go back to <laughs> Texas. And let's see, uh, tell me now, Tennessee, if there's anything left for me. I'm so tired of being tired, just another bird. On the telephone wire Mama calls me every day Saying why do you have to move away Well I'm over being over it all The further I climb The harder I fall Did I ever really believe It would be You know, Matt wrote these beautiful lyrics um, that still mean so much to me and I know mean so much to Sixpence fans, but I also have a voice and I also have some stuff to say and I'm going to say it. Uh, I'm not going to hold back. But now I'm in a season where I really feel I've stepped into my shoes as a writer and only because of God. I feel like I want to write stuff that's inspired and breathed on me by the Holy Spirit. Things That Matter, Something Worth Leaving Behind, which is a song that, <laughs> that I wrote. <laughs> well, it sounds like what your mom tells you every day, things that are eternal. A hundred percent, yeah. There's an agricultural center close to where my best friend lives, um, where the police train their horses, the mounted police. And... My best friend, she has a really strong connection with the place and with the horses. She just loves to go, and they're in their stalls at night, and she goes at night, and the police are cool with her because she's she's a therapist, and she's one of the most charming people. She can charm you into anything, so they let her go just do whatever she wants. But um, she loves those horses, and she goes and sees them every single night. And I stayed over at her house one night, and the next morning— I was like, I, I really want to go home because when I stay over at her house, I'm usually out the door and want to be back in my house by like 7 a.m. So I don't miss anything here. But she was like, come on, let me, I'll make you coffee. I'll do anything. Just please go to the Ag Center with me and we'll take Oso it was her dog. He just passed away. Best dog in the world. And she really had to drag me there. So we get in her car. I'm super ticked off about it. But I do have my special um, her name's Jiffy, my my special Jiffy latte. And we get there, and I'd been before to see the horses, and I'm like, okay, yeah, they're horses, whatever. But it's daytime, um, and I hadn't been there in the daytime before, and we were standing where the horses run out in their, in their big 
pen. And it's a beautiful thing to watch a horse run and be free. And we were just standing there watching and just loving that. And one came up and we were, you know, petting its nose and Jiffy knows all their names and was talking about the horse. And then a man came out of the barn and um, he had a coat on because it was winter time. And he looked pretty rough around the edges. He definitely, we knew he wasn't a cop because that's mostly who you see out there as, as policemen. But he started talking to us and being really vulnerable and kind and just kind of asking questions about us too. But then we realized, oh, that's a prison outfit under there, <laughs> under that coat. So he starts telling his story about why he was imprisoned and how hard it was, what the hardest things about it were and how much he misses his wife and his family and that, you know, he is good in prison. So they let him come and work with the horses as part of a, you know, mm. program that they do and what that means to him. And he says, yeah, these are, these are my best friends. Um, we just talked to him for maybe 10 minutes. We got his name. His name is Dwayne. And Jiffy and I really didn't talk much about it, but I remember opening the door to her car and I heard um, the state gave me 18 months, but God gave me horses. And I thought, all right, this is going to be a song. I'm already like halfway tearing up about it. And I want to say it took about four or five months to to like, I, I held on to that idea because you don't want to, I tried to write it by myself, but I, I play the guitar, but not the kind that I needed to get the trot for that song. And so I finally got hooked up with this writer named Connie Harrington, and I wanted to write it with a with a female, and she was a, the perfect person to write. It's hard to write a story song anyway, mm -hmm. but she just seemed to have that vibe, and I was like, I have this idea, and I trusted her with it, and we sat there and slogged it out and wrote God Gave Me Horses, and i am never been prouder of a song and more thankful for a song. And uh, my friend Jiffy, who has a relationship with all the police there at the Ag Center, she was like, I need you to make a CD. I need you to make a lot of CDs for every single <laughs> police officer there. And we're going to give them this song. Because I emailed it to the captain, like, almost immediately. And he was like, I'm in tears. Then a stranger in his prison blues handed me I wanted Dwayne to have it, but he said with tears in his eyes, a little bit of a tear in his eye, he said he'll hear it when he's ready to hear it. I was like, okay, I don't know what that means. I don't know what I don't know what's up with Dwayne. I've I've tried to find him. I kind of don't want to. I feel like it'll happen if and when it's supposed to. Um, because he could still, he may still be, he may have reoffended and he may still be back in there. But I would think this would be important for him to know <laughs> that because of his vulnerability, so many people will be impacted by his story. Um, it's about to come out again as a fresh single, and there's some really exciting stuff going on with that song. So the chances of him hearing it are greater than they were even a year ago. Hmm. So I guess I wrote it a year, a year and a half, two years ago. That song has sort of given me wings that if I am patient and just go about living my life and I don't resist God and I don't resist hints that songs will come, you know, line, the yeah. lines will almost write themselves. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, so much of your early career started off with you singing Matt's songs mm -hmm. and 
your kind of narrative arc has so much to do with you finding your own voice. Right. Like I used to think to write a great song, it needed to be as deep and the way that Matt writes songs. Like I have to read Dylan Thomas and C.S. Lewis and all those, you know, authors that he he would just bring stacks of books on the road. And I was like, that's where he gets all this stuff. He's smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm boy crazy. But yeah, now I'm older and, <laughs> and Matt has said, I'm proud of you. Like this this is great. Like what to, you don't get compliments from Matt that often. I I don't. Hmm. And for him to be proud of where I am, it, I mean, it means more than anything to me. And then to understand I have my own voice. It doesn't have to be trying to be like Matt's voice. And that is so exciting to me. I can feel God telling me you don't have to hmm. just chill out and wait and experience your life and love people well, and it'll come. I experienced so much trauma as a child that I feel like it has informed the artist that I am and the way that I'm able to connect with audiences and be vulnerable and empathetic, those things make you a, a very enigmatic performer. And it was trauma after trauma after trauma because my dad drank and had a temper. And my parents had some friends who were going to ha have dinner at their house. And Texas is, you know, there's hill, we were in the hill country. I grew up south of Austin and we were headed out west. And so there's some drop-offs and there's actually some cliffs out there. Like you wouldn't think so. You think of Texas as being flat unless you're familiar with it. But we were kind of, I think, in the Wimberley area, lots of hills. And Molly and I, as usual, my sister's name is Molly, we were fighting like cats and dogs in the back of the car, eating our big league chew, whatever. And <laughs> my parents were talking and <laughs> we just started fighting so we're going around a, a bend, and on this side, there's the weird Texas cliff thing, and a driver was coming toward us in our lane. It was a two-lane highway. So my dad could have taken a right and gone over an embankment and potentially killed us all or make a sharp turn to the left to avoid getting hit head-on. And so what happened was she, the drunk driver, uh, hit my mom directly. But what I what I didn't mention, we were fighting and seconds before the accident, my mom said, Leanne, get on the floorboard and lay down and take a nap. And Molly, you lay on the seat back there. So if we hadn't done that, one of us, I don't remember who was sitting behind my mom, we would have been in bad shape too. So that wow. happened, I mean, seconds before the accident. I remember that. And then the thing is, it was the 80s and very few people had car phones. And we were out Wimberley in that area, not heavily trafficked area. It was pretty remote. And within, I remember um, the drunk driver is the one, she was drunk as all get out. She was screaming because her kitten had gone through the windshield and was dead. Um, but she's the one that pulled me out of the back of the car. And a car came by within a minute and a half um, that had a car phone in it. And it was a doctor and a nurse. Wow. And so they called the hospital. Wow. And the nurse, the female, pulled my sister out the back. And then the drunk lady pulled me out. And I remember my dad said, get over against that fence and pray for your mama. <laughs> and we did. And it took the jaws of life to get her out. I mean, it was, it was awful. But there's no way she would have made it if that car hadn't come, come when it did. So it was... 100%, you know, a miracle that day that she survived. So that was the beginning of that piece of trauma. But because of his drinking, there had been so much before and there was so much after. I think even more after because I think he never got over the guilt of 
turning that way. There was really nothing he could have done right. I mean, it was just a horrible, yeah. horrible situation. Yeah, I can't even imagine, but I don't think he ever got over it. And um, that miracle that happened that day, I've always felt like I no longer have the right to doubt God. And that has been a huge blessing because there's like, there's no way <laughs> there, there's a God and he loves us. And uh, we were protected that day for whatever reason. It could have gone very differently. And, and my mom, my gosh, she's still here. Mm. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, without my mom, there would have been no sixpence. There would have been no, none of this, you know, none of me. Why wouldn't there have been a sixpence? I wouldn't have been going to church. I met Matt on a school, like not a school bus, but it was a bus, a church bus on the way to some mission trip. And he's so, he was so shy and awkward. And I'm sure, I'm sure I was too. I'm not just pinning it on him, but he literally, he, he had a tape in his pocket, like a cassette tape. And he, I, I want to say he almost tossed it at me and we barely knew each other. I was so much younger, but he'd heard me sing at church and liked my voice. And he'd written this song called The Fatherless and the Widow because he had just lost his father and wrote this song. Hmm. And um, there was a dude singing it and he wanted to see what it sounded like with a girl singing it. So he's like, hey, hey. Hey, you want to take a listen to this? I'm just thinking maybe we could get together and, you, you know, you could, like, try to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I hope he doesn't hear this podcast. But um, <laughs> but that was that was our first, that was the first meeting. But, no, I would not have been there. I would not have met Matt. I wouldn't have been the person that I was, like, just this sort of open heart. Hmm. My mom and her survival and the grace that we all had to have for each other growing up because of my dad's constant screwing up. And we loved him so much. I wouldn't have been available for all that. If your mom had died in that accident, who do you think Lee Nash would be today? I have so many, you know, one part of me wants to say, well, it wouldn't have happened because God had and has a plan, so it was going to be this way no matter what. Yeah, I just don't know what would have happened, but no, my mom is, she's like the, the yellow rose of Texas. There's no one like her. She beams kindness, and she's hilarious, and, you know, like I said, she's always in her Bible, and, um... And if I lost her, I mean, I don't know what would have happened. I'm not, I'm not here to say, I mean, only God knows, but he spared her for a reason. And, and it's it left a, you know, indelible mark on me forever. This episode of Instrumental was produced by me, JJ Heller. And me, Dave Heller. Our theme music is my song, Big Love, Small Moments. That I helped write. <laughs> to find out more about me, listen to more of my songs, or watch my music videos, please visit jjheller.com. That's two letter J's, H-E-L-L-E-R.com. We'll be back next week with another episode of Instrumental. So be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.